Indian gurus. There are many. They come in many forms, many titles, many styles. But there's a great similarity in how they dominate the individual. How they basically use the idea of spiritual truth to steamroll over a person's personality. Making them a drone, essentially speaking. A good example is Asaram Bapu. He is also known as God-Man. In early 1970, he built his first ashram, which is kind of like a monastery or place of spiritual development. According to various reports, there are now over 400 ashrams. These various monasteries focus on the extreme devotion to spiritual development, following the practices and traditions of yoga mixed in with some other traditions, following the doctrine of the Guru. As with many Guru beliefs, the followers are encouraged to surrender earthly goods, material possessions, to relieve themselves of their money. The ashram's mission is to provide spiritual, moral, educational and health-related upliftment. The organisation also is involved in providing financial aid to the poor and needy. The organisation has gained a reputation for stealing land. They'll get a plot of land to build a monastery, a communal group where people can go and learn, develop spiritually. And then they will annex land around them because no one seems to contend their ownership. Some people do, and in some cases they get pushed back. Perhaps the best known example is with the Asaram Ashram, which is like their main one, and they were meant to have only 10 acres. However, they commandeered six extra acres to use for their purpose. The local government bulldozed the buildings on the extra land, ensuring that they pay attention to the land that they own and that they do not encroach upon other people's territory. In some cases, they've been given land temporarily to use for a purpose, a special get-together or religious ceremony, and then they have not given the land back at the end of that period. One such instance had an area of 100 acres of land valued at over 7 billion rupees being held on to by the organisation. Of course, the guru's excuse is to say that they have no involvement and reports were baseless and untenable. It seems like the trick is to deny any wrongdoing. A guru denies any wrongdoing and they can get away with practically anything. They simply get around the problem by not engaging the problem and denying any responsibility or involvement. And the believers, they will believe that because they respect and believe in the guru. With strange spiritual beliefs and dishonesty, you find stupidity. In this case, a statement which says about a particular gang rape in Delhi that the woman who was involved, the woman who was brutalised, was just as guilty as the men who brutalised her. Of course, once again, the guru denied ever making any statement to that effect. He even announced a reward of 50,000 rupees for anyone who can prove he blamed the victim for the gang rape. Although the actual allegation was he was blaming the victim as well as the actual rapists. So by doing that, he is sidestepping the issue somewhat. The actual statement itself from Asharam is something quite special, quite peculiar. Even greater levels of gullibility have been reached when he says the girl should have taken God's name and could have held the hand of one of the men and said, I consider you my brother, and then said the same to the other two. She should have said, brothers, I am helpless. You are my brothers, my religious brothers. The guru then claims if she had done this, the misconduct 
wouldn't have happened, as if by magic it would not have taken place because she would have invoked a spiritual conscience in them. The remarks led to condemnation across the political spectrum. It only meant that if one of these individuals had remembered their religious teachings, the crime would not have occurred. The Guru also said that laws should not be made harsher in cases of gang rape because the powers given to the court could be misused. However, where the shit really hits the fan is with more recent events in 2013 where he was accused of sexually assaulting a 16-year-old girl at his ashram. The girl was meant to be there as a sort of pretext to exercising her from evil spirits. Two days after the alleged assault, the parents of the girl reported the incident to the police. A medical examination of the girl confirmed that she had in fact been assaulted. Asaram did not appear for interrogation, in fact he evaded capture for several months on charges ranging from rape, wrongful confinement, criminal intimidation and a variety of other child and sex offences. The Guru dismissed the allegations as nonsense and went further, suggesting there was a conspiracy perpetrated by the ruling Congress party. Numerous other individuals have come forward and said that they too have seen or suffered abuses in this organisation. And even the Guru's son has been charged on two counts of rape. Some of you may notice that the characteristics of this organisation, including the abuse, fit very closely with what we'd call a cult organisation. If we are to use, for example, the cult characteristics as laid out by Robert J. Lifton, a professional in the field of cults and new religions, it becomes far clearer. First we have the idea of the leader, the guru, being the centre of worship as opposed to the broader religious principles. So what do we have with the organisation that follows the God-man? We have the idea of worship of the guru following his ideas and his truth, disregarding that which does not fit for he is the man who cannot be wrong. Secondly, we have thought reform. We have indoctrination of the individual. The continual process of enforcing the idea that the beliefs of the group are the truth. That you don't need to look at other beliefs and other ideas, simply follow the beliefs as passed on by the leadership. So you follow those ideas, you go through deep meditations because the belief is true and that continues the process or thought manipulation. Thirdly, you have exploitation, where you're fooling people out of their money, out of their property. You're manipulating those below you, those who've taken on the belief. That manipulation is usually money. It can be physical abuse, and in this case, it goes further to the inevitable sexual abuse. And it is highly probable that many abuses in the past will never become public knowledge. There is one thing you will notice with cult organisations. The cult itself is the extension of the cult leader. He makes it part of himself since it follows him. And so the characteristics of the leader are passed on to the followers. And so what should we see coming from the various websites for that organisation, the followers of Godman. We see them dismissing the arguments, calling it a conspiracy, and then claiming that they're justified in beating up members of the press and the police because they must be involved in the conspiracy. Sadly, when faith and ignorance come together, they form a solid bond which is very hard to break. And so the Guru and his cult will linger on for some time to come.